scary stories. It all started when my mom's mother died. My grandma had a husband, my mom's stepfather, who she married later in life. My mom didn't know him well, but thought he was an okay guy. But over time, my grandparents' relationship soured. My grandma complained that they fought all the time. There wasn't any signs the relationship was actually abusive, although in retrospect, maybe it was. Anyway, my grandma died suddenly, and my mom and I went to stay with my stepfather so we could sort through my grandma's stuff. Help him with all the shit you have to take care of after a death. My mom started to notice some things didn't add up. My grandma had been healthy and active, and she just suddenly stopped breathing in her sleep. Okay, it happens, I guess. But why was my stepfather so cheerful? And why did he have an expensive vacation planned next month, booked before her death, with no ticket for my grandma? when they always vacationed together before. In a house full of disorganized clutter, isn't it convenient that he had all the relevant insurance, will, legal, etc. information already gathered neatly in a folder, which my mom was prevented from looking at? Just lots of little things that made my mom wonder. It seemed like he had prepared for a death no one saw coming. So she started asking questions, and that's when we started getting stomach aches. They happened regularly, after meals, and got worse towards the end of each day. Previously, my mom and my step-grandfather had alternated cooking, but he started insisting that he take care of all the cooking, to the point where he was aggressive about it. Being so young, my memory of all this is foggy, a mixture of my true memories and what my mom has told me. But I do have some clear memories. And one of these is, my mom sat down at the table, then walked over to the counter where he was finishing the meal, unaware of her approaching. When she reached out to grab a finished dish and set it on the table, he noticed that the last minute and screamed at her, Leave that alone! I've got it! And snatched it away from her. She watched him carefully after that and noticed that he always seemed to fiddle with two of the dishes right before serving them, always to me and my mom. She was getting scared now, so early one morning she snuck a look at the folder of insurance and legal documents I mentioned earlier. The details are too personal to go into. What she saw there convinced her. She believes, and I do too, that my stepfather tired of being married to someone he hated and not wanting to lose his assets in divorce, smothered my grandma to death in her sleep. When we came around and started asking questions, he poisoned us, either to kill us, to cover up the murder, or to make us sick enough that we'd want to go home to recover. I think the latter is more likely, but I was a small child, and I was getting very sick and it would have been easy to overdose me, even if he didn't intend to. My mom woke me, and we immediately fled. The stomach ache stopped. A few weeks later, we broke the lease on our apartment and moved somewhere he would never find us. Just in case, we never spoke to him again. I asked my mom years later why she didn't go to the police, and she said she didn't know. She was still reeling from the death of her mom and did what felt was right at the time. So that's the story. Children are surprisingly resilient, or clueless. So this didn't really bother me when I was younger. And aside from using it every two truths and a lie game I've ever played, I didn't think about how fucked up it was until I was older. How much danger I was in, really. Twenty years later, he is still alive. And where is he now? Creepy Grandpa? If you were out there, somewhere, let's not meet again. This happened a while back. I went through a bit of a stoner phase. Me and a friend of mine would meet up at night on occasion to smoke weed after getting off of work. We would chat, smoke, listen to music in his car, 
and then go back to our houses as the high wore off. This one particular night, he picked me up around 10.30 p.m. and parked his car at a popular local park. Rather than smoking, we took marijuana-infused candy. We sat in the car with music playing loudly as we were slowly getting higher and higher as the edibles kicked in. Our attention to the car's surroundings had, by this point, fully dissipated, and we were shocked as we saw two dark figures jump out from the right side of the vehicle and start running forward through the parking lot. As they started running, a large SUV with the truck already open quickly drove in front of them. The two figures hopped in and shut the door to the trunk of the car as it slid away from the park. Despite how idiotic it sounds now, we both had a bit of a laugh after they drove away, figuring it was just some teenagers fucking around. About 30 minutes passed and we had forgotten about it, due to our then currently altered states of mind. We had yet again stopped paying attention to our surroundings. A few cars had driven in and out of the parking lot since then, and we had never bothered to look at them too closely. As our high was at its peak and in intensity, I suddenly noticed in the side mirror that the SUV that had sped away earlier was parked directly behind us with its lights off. I'm pointing this out to my friend. He looked pretty nervous, but began trying to rationalize it, saying that it might just be a different car after all, or maybe that they just wanted to park for a bit like we were at the time. We both got a bit creeped out and decided to start driving off, and then the SUV behind us starts its engine and began to follow us. It was about midnight by this point, and there were no other cars on the road, so they just kept on following us. We kept turning onto different roads throughout the quiet residential neighborhood we found ourselves in. We were trying desperately to see if we could lose them, but they were a mere car length behind us the whole time. We were driving aimlessly for about 10 minutes, panicking at this point. We decided our best option would be to drive somewhere where we might encounter other people. We made our way to a local grocery store at the nearest strip mall, parking next to the only other car in the lot, and my friend was terrified of the idea of being chased while stoned on a busier road in the middle of the night. As we parked the car, the car started to rapidly circle ours over and over again. They did this for about 15 minutes. Eventually, one of them opened the sunroof and poked his torso out and began yelling at us. The man was white, average size, and appeared to be in his late 20s or early 30s. He kept repeating something along the lines of, We're gonna kick your fucking ass! You fucking faggots! As he made obscene gestures directed at us. This was accompanied by everybody else in the car yelling and trying to intimidate us. I could make out the voices of the three or four other people. I was positive that at this point they were waiting for one of us to snap and exit our vehicle. Me and my friend were ferociously debating as to if we should call the cops or not. My friend was hesitant due to his somewhat intoxicated state and was worried he could get into trouble with the police. We waited for another five minutes as they did this until we saw a rather beefy and muscled man exit the grocery store with shopping bags in his hands heading towards the car parked alongside us. He began to unlock his car. I bolted out of my friend's car and quickly explained the situation to the man. He quickly noticed the SUV circling us. The man sticking out of the SUV saw that we were no longer alone. He ducked back into the car as he drove off down the road. The man seemed sympathetic to the situation we found ourselves in and waited with us for a few minutes until we were sure the SUV wasn't coming back. Me and my friend drove around for a little bit to make sure we were definitely not being followed again and he soon dropped me off at my house. I cut my cannabis use drastically since that night, and my friend quit entirely. It was probably the most scared both of us had ever been in our lives, 
car full of possibly homophobic stalker maniacs. I hope I never meet any of you again. A year ago, I was coming back home late at night from then my boyfriend's place. He lives in a few cities over, about a 50-minute drive. I was coming home late around 3 a.m. We both live in major cities, so the roads were well lit, and I didn't get through any shady areas. Also, I'm a young woman in my early 20s, so this experience is especially scary. As I get off the highway close to my place, I am stopped at a red light with another car. It was a black SUV. The car is a little bit ahead of me in the lane beside me, so the front of my car is closer to the back end of that car. As I get off the highway close to my place, I am stopped at a red light with another car. It's a guy in a black SUV. He is a little bit ahead of me in the lane beside me. So the front of my car is closer to the back end of his car. He rolls down the window and sticks his head out and looks at me for about five seconds. He looks to be mid-twenties, early thirties, Middle Eastern looking man with a buzz cut. He puts his head back in his car and rolls up the window. Okay, so that was weird, I think to myself. I kind of glance at his license plate and notice it's a custom one. It was unique and memorable. This will be important later on. I try not to think much of it and carry on my way. I notice my gas is low, so I head to the gas station close to my place. I see his car in my rearview mirror and notice he turns off into another major road heading the opposite of where I was ahead, so I was relieved. When I get gas and headed down the main road to my house, I'm driving for five minutes, and I'm literally two minutes away from my house. I see a car nearly rear in me, flashing its high beams at me like mad. I look at my dashboard to see if I mistakenly left something on open and checked my side mirror to see if my gas hatch was open. Perhaps this person was trying to warn me or tell me something, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I go a little faster and turn on to another main road to see if he'll follow me, and he's still right on my tail. I'm panicking at this point and zoom right past my house. No way I was going to lead him to where I lived. He's still chasing me and high-beaming me like crazy. Thoughts were racing through my mind, like, oh my god, this is how I am going to die. As I turn onto another main road, I scramble for my phone so I can call 911. This guy comes from behind me to right next to my car. I feel him glaring at me. I force myself not to look. I don't want to see this nasty person's face. I bring my phone to my ear and the 911 operator picks up. I'm stuttering my words to this woman telling her that there is a psycho chasing me and that he was trying to kill me. I tell them to come quick. The woman tells me to stop and park my car. I said there was no way I was going to do that because he was still chasing me. What if then I stop, he stops and gets out of his car, then what? After about 30 seconds, she convinced me to pull over and I felt that if I wanted help, I should comply. At this point, we are going about 110 miles per hour in a 60 mile per hour zone. So I hit the brakes and his car flies forward. I see the license plate and it's the same guy from when I got off the highway. I took note of the car make, color, and remembered his face. I see his brake lights come on. I can tell he was thinking about whether he should turn around and continue chasing me. He decides against it and speeds off. I'm almost in tears at this point, giving the operator the play-by-play -play about what is happening. I pull into this neighborhood side street and explain to her, all the details of the car and person, and she says it's not found. I give her different variations of it and still nothing. She says I can wait in the neighborhood for the police to come to file a report, but that'll take 20 minutes. It was nearly 4 a.m. at this point, and I was tired. I decided against it and went home. I don't know what would have happened if I stopped for him, or worse, went home. Disgusting car chaser. 
Let's not meet ever again. I live in a pretty major UK city and moved here when I was a student seven years ago. In my second year of university, I was living with three other girls in a little house, an area that has really dodgy outskirts, known for crime, the kind of place where students are warned to stay by the main road at night. A few roads away from me was a street that had become infamous for rapes and sexual assaults that year. There was supposedly a guy or a gang of guys on the loose and the story was constantly being covered in on the news at the time. So one morning I set off for university at around 8.30 a.m. It was a nice sunny spring morning and I had my music player on and my iPhone. I walked from my house into the back of a car park with a large supermarket on the main road. As I was walking up the slope leading alongside the supermarket to the street, the bus to the university stopped just outside the shop. I became aware of someone walking behind me. I immediately took one earphone out as I looked at him through my peripheral view. He had a bike, so I assumed he wanted to get past, and I hung back for a bit. He stopped, and I got a proper look at him. He was dark-skinned, around 35, and extremely fat. Not in a horrible way. I don't usually notice stuff like that, but he is by far the biggest person I have ever seen with my own eyes. Anyway, I thought you were Sarah. I'm Tony. Oh no, I'm not. I laugh awkwardly and start walking away as alarm bells were ringing. As I said, this is the kind of place where you don't chat to random blokes. He speeds up to walk alongside me, asking me questions about where I got out clubbing. Asking me questions about where I go out clubbing. When I'm next going out, what I like drinking. I humor him as the main road was like a hundred meters away, and there were people anyway. I'm just kind of giving him quick answers and give up on my music by unplugging my iPhone, stuffing my headphones in my pocket. Can I have your number? Sorry, uh, I'll give you my number. So he reads me his number out, and I just put it in, thinking that will be that. Okay, now ring it. I know I should have said I don't have credit or whatever, I know. But in the weirdness of the moment, I did it. Then I said I had to go, and walked quickly around the side of the building to the main road, and went straight into the supermarket, as I didn't want to have to wait by the bus stop with him there. I looked behind me and saw him locking his bike up outside the entrance, so I quickly ducked down an aisle, went around the back of the supermarket, and popped up at the end of the other aisle to look at the entrance. Guess who was walking along checking the aisles? I darted across, used the checkouts lining the other side of the shop as cover, and somehow made it back outside. There was no bus. I stood close to a group of people waiting, keeping an eye on the shop entrance. Tony appeared and smiled this massive, toothy grin at me. The bus arrived and I jumped on relieved to be finally free of him. Then the phone calls started. By the time I had gotten to university 30 minutes later, I had about five missed calls and a voicemail. I go into my class and immediately told my friends Alex and Gaz. I was kind of laughing it off at this point, and the whole class was listening in to the voicemails, and it was all a bit of a joke. What did he look like? Alex asked. I told her that he's around 35 and morbidly obese. She asked rather I've seen the local newspapers today. The police have released an e-fit of one of the suspected rapists in the areas. Mid-30s, dark-skinned, and extremely fat. So now things take a more sinister turn, and it's no longer funny as the calls and the voicemails rack up even more. By midway, I had 11 missed calls and 4 emails all mentioning the club night he was talking about. When can he take me there, etc. I decided to call the police and they came to my house that afternoon. He actually phoned while they were there 
and the policewoman answered it. After taking down all the details, they left and promised to be in touch. The next day, a cop in plain clothes comes up. Tony was a convicted rapist, and they had him in the police station. The name Tony and the number I had given them checked straight out of the records and led them to his door. Never heard anything else from him or the situation. Ironically, I have recently moved to the infamous Rape Road. Although within a 10 second walk from the main road, Tony, whoever you are, please, let's not meet ever again.